Welcome and thank you for joining us for the first open public session of Packaging for the Planet 2021. In a few minutes, you'll see the first three speeches about packaging and the planet from blue chip billion dollar players, AB InBev, Berry Global and Colgate Palmolive. For the best experience, we recommend attending the conference via a desktop or laptop personal computer using the Chrome browser, although other modern browsers should be absolutely fine. We recommend a good internet connection, not via cell phone. If you are watching during the live broadcast, then open YouTube in full screen and you'll be able to comment and ask questions if you access them in your Google account. During the conference in June, you can also post questions and start discussions in the LinkedIn event, Packaging for the Planet. Search LinkedIn for Packaging for the Planet. But before we start, I wanted to let you know how we got here today. 25 years ago, I moved to Madrid, Spain. At the time, there were four ski resorts in Madrid, and now there are just two. Two have been closed, in part due to the lack of consistent snow. Then in January 2021, Madrid was paralysed for a week after it was hit by the biggest snowstorm on records. Total, utter chaos. You don't have to go to the poles to see the effect of climate change. It is right here on our doorsteps. Human behaviour is affecting our planet as we burn fossil fuels and pollute. But also as we travel globally and spread disease, COVID is the modern day result of massive social contact. But this isn't new. When Columbus landed in the Americas some 500 years ago, populations were wiped out by viruses. Plagues, smogs and other human-triggered disasters have happened for centuries. So here we are again fighting pollution, viruses and climate change. But what are we really fighting? The battle really is against human behaviour. Having worked for over 25 years in the packaging industry, it's clear to me that packaging is there to offer solutions. Reusability, recyclability, sustainability, the ability to transport food, drink and medicine safely to protect the planet from harmful chemicals and to keep us alive. However, every day I see humans break this cycle by throwing packaging on the ground or into rivers and seas. It's hugely disappointing. And that is just the tip of the iceberg of bad human behavior. So as the CEO of Webpack with 25 years experience of working with packaging suppliers and consumer brands, I thought, what more can we do to help the planet? Whilst face-to-face -face communication will gradually return, it's not always necessary. And in the future, we'll think twice before traveling. With this in mind, we've decided to create a permanent, always open, online, true 3D exhibition for the packaging industry, where you can explore and interact with packaging and contact and communicate with packaging suppliers. I'm proud and happy to announce the launch of Web Packaging Live, webpackaging.live. We're starting with more than 60 exhibitors and the show will go on all year round. Just type webpackaging.live into your web browser, on your PC, log in and off you go. Filter by market or product. Visit the 3D stands of suppliers and chat directly with them. If you are a supplier and wish to participate, then please email live at webpackaging.com and we'll explain all. The other thing we decided to do was to create this conference, Packaging for the Planet where we have six amazing keynote speakers from billion dollar players, including Colgate Palmolive, Tetra Pak, Berry Global, Danone, and AB InBev. You'll see three of these today, but don't forget to tune in to the second broadcast on the 10th of June to see three more. None of this would be possible without the support of our sponsor suppliers, and I'd like to thank each and every one of them. Alpha Packaging, Altium Packaging, Anomatic, Aptar Beauty and Home, Avantis Group, Berry Global, Copco China, Element Packaging, Gecker, Heinz Glass, Hoffman the Tin, Neopack the Tube, Neville and Moore, Nest Villa, Phoenix Packaging, Tricor Braun, Trivium Packaging, Quality Resourcing Services, Quadpack, 
Yonru PKG. Again, you can visit their interactive 3D exhibition stands by going to webpackaging.live. Thank you also to the keynote speakers and thanks to everyone at Webpack and also to Paul McDonald for helping us put together this event. And finally, thank you for attending. Enjoy, learn, interact, and together, let's make a real difference. Thanks, Duncan. That really was a very interesting and thought-provoking introduction. Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us here at the first ever Packaging for the Planet 2021 conference sponsored by Web Packaging Live. My name is Paul MacDonald, and it has been an absolute pleasure to help Duncan, Lars, and the team at Web Packaging to put on this conference. I've worked for many years organizing packaging exhibitions, conferences, and awards around the world, but I now feel there is real momentum behind the desire to reduce the packaging industry's environmental impact and to work together for the good of people and planet. We have an inspiring lineup of global packaging influencers for you today. Our speakers are also on hand to answer any of your questions. And so I do encourage you to use the chat function in YouTube to ask questions of our guests. So without further delay, let me introduce our opening keynote speaker to kick off the conference. Please put your hands together and welcome to the stage, Eline Casagrande, who is the Circular Packaging Global Director for AB InBev. AB InBev is the world's largest brewer with approximately 630 beer brands in 150 countries and an annual turnover in 2020 of $46.88 billion. Aline has 14 years of packaging and procurement experience with AB InBev and is now responsible for the implementation of their global circular packaging strategy as part of their 2025 sustainability goals. Aline's episode is entitled Circular Packaging, Join Us on Our Journey. How AB InBev is rethinking its packaging and reducing its environmental footprint for the good of people and planet. Over to you, Aline. Hi, I am Aline, part of the AB InBev team working as a Packaging Sustainability Global Director and leading the circular packaging strategy to rethink packaging and to create impact through our circular packaging programs. I am part of the BIMBAV uh, for almost 15 years now, and I've passed through different areas from supply, innovation, procurement, and now in sustainability. And I can say that sustainability was always part of our business strategy. But today, uh, we'll dig into what we are doing, the circular packaging, as I mentioned before. So just before getting to that, ABI is the biggest beer company in the world uh, with more than 160,000 employees operating in more than 50 different countries and producing more than 500 different brands across uh, different beverage categories. Some of these brands uh, that I included here in these slides, so Budweiser, Stella, Corona Beer, and that I hope uh, you had the chance to, to try. Because we are operating the business uh, for the past 600 years and more, and because we want to continue operating for the next 100 plus years, we set up our 2025 sustainability goals. We want to be sure we are creating a value chain that will be here for the future. And it is thinking about our value chain from seed to seed, from our farmers to our consumers, that uh, we set up four ambitious goals. And these goals are across uh, our value chain that we included here in this slide that looks quite busy actually, but it is to share with you how they are across the value chain. These goals are one, starting from our farmers, from the seed, uh, to have 100% of our farmers skilled, connected, and financially empowered. The second uh, goal is the water stewardship, that is to have 100% of our communities in high-risk areas to have access 
to measurable improved water quality and availability. Uh, the other goal is around reducing across our value chain 25% of our carbon emissions, as well as guaranteeing that 100% of our uh, purchase electricity uh, is coming from renewable sources. And the fourth goal is about our packaging. It is to guarantee that 100% of our products will be in packaging that is returnable or made of majority recycled content. There is one common theme around those four goals, that is to build this local resilient supply chain. And well, why did we set up specific goals on packaging? And I know some of the companies uh, normally don't set up something specific for some areas, but we decided to do so. We decided to do that because we know packaging uh, has three important impacts in our supply chain. The first one is around the waste generation and how everything that we are putting out there will continue to be out there if we don't put this back into the supply chain. The, third, the second piece is around the natural resources and the nature depletion that happens to produce packaging materials. So really thinking about every single bottle uh, that you are consuming, it does mean that to produce that one bottle, we are extracting something from, from the nature. If you take aluminum, for example, according to the aluminum liter, it takes between four to five toners of bullshit to produce one single ton of aluminum. And the third point there is around greenhouse gas emissions. And if you take a look at the chart, you will see that the packaging material is the single, single biggest contributor in our supply chain in greenhouse gas emissions with more than 36%. So huge impact coming from packaging the environmental area to not mention other, other important aspect of packaging that is this unique connection between uh, in, with our consumers actually the first and the last interaction that our consumers have with our products. But we have big challenge to, to address. So if, if we go a little bit deeper on the greenhouse gas emissions and, the, the, and how it is uh, per different type of packaging that we produce, you can see here in the chart that kegs and returnable glass bottles that are the ones that we consider returnables uh, are the ones with the lower carbon emissions per hectoliter produced, followed by PET, cans, and one-way glass in this order. This does mean that our returnable solutions, uh, that are, by the way, is the ones that are refillables, meaning we sell, we collect it back, we clean, and we use the same packaging material to, to sell it back beer again, so these are, these are the materials that we believe uh, could help us the most with the environmental impact. And of course, uh, as you see there, they, they have the lowest contribution into greenhouse gas emissions. They also have the lowest contribution into waste generation. And they also can uh, have a positive impact if you think about uh, commercially and socially that normally they are the more affordable options that uh, the company had as well. So what is the big problem here? The big problem is that our one-way packaging SKUs continue to increase. The consumption of one-way packaging continue to increase across different countries. And we did an internal assessment uh, on trying to understand why that was happening. And it does look like it has a direct connection with GDP and the increase of GDP uh, in the countries. So the more mature or the higher the GDP, the more consumers want sophistication in home consumption, conveniency, and differentiation. So the harder it is to maintain returnables in these markets. So this is a big topic to address. And of course, one of the ways is through recycling, recycled content. And really, uh, here are the recycled content of our different packaging materials 
that we recently published in our 2025 uh, ESG report. 2020, sorry, ESG report. And recycled content can play uh, important roles here. So it does avoid uh, usage of new materials. It does integrate waste or what was before waste into the supply chain, but it's, it also helps us to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. If you take PET, for example, this reduction, it's around 40% something similar to glass bottles and up to 85% in aluminum. So we know this can hugely contribute uh, to, towards our 2025 sustainability goals. But really, uh, this is one of the impact areas that we touch when we work in the, cir in the circular packaging programs. If we, if we really think about all the different aspects that we can generate and all the different impacts that we can generate through our circular packaging programs, we have at least impact in the social and in the commercial uh, areas as well. And we want to mindfully think about that and create impact on these areas as well. And this is what I'm sharing uh, later on here with you. So, we built our strategy towards 2025, our packaging strategy towards 2025, thinking about four main pillars that I need to say are interconnected with one uh, big in, uh, contribution that is to achieve our 2025 goal to be 100% returnable majority recycled content. Uh, and going through these different pillars, the first one is innovation and how we rethink our packaging and packaging materials uh, to reduce or even completely eliminate waste. We believe we need to stop the problem where it initiates, and it does initiate when we are designing something to put in the market. The second pillar are our brands, and our brands are a key element of connection with our consumers. And it's a key element to create awareness, but also to enable our consumers to be part of the solution. So thinking about these two different pillars, I want to give you an example, a recent example uh, that, that we launched in the market. So I, I think you might have seen, and this is a new secondary packaging current I'm putting the market um, in March with this spirit of rethinking and reimagining our packaging. Our global innovation team in Belgium, together with Corona Beer, took the waste that uh, our farmers had from the production of barley to produce packaging, new packaging materials that would be later on used in our secondary packaging. This creates a new business for our farmers, but also reduce our packaging footprint. So coming back into the strategy, the other pillars are the accelerator and the partners and partnerships that we have uh, with the supply chain. So talking a little bit about the accelerator, the accelerator uh, was created back there in 2018 when we set up the 2025 sustainability goals. And the main idea behind was to bring these disruptive innovations and mindset into the business. Uh, and this was the one point of connection to the startups and entrepreneurs in the market. Uh, it, we, so far, we had pilot uh, 35, 36 different projects across the different sustainability challenges, and they came from across the globe, from uh, 16 different countries. The fourth pillar there is around partners and partnership, and this is really about thinking all the way from our suppliers, our peers, but also the waste collectors and recyclers that are working the supply chain. And I brought here some uh, examples of how we are working in these two other pillars as well. So the first one is around is green mining. Green mining is a Brazilian startup that was part of the first cohort in the accelerator in 2019. And it mines high concentration area of waste generation, and it has developed an intelligence reverse logistics technology 
to collect past consumer waste uh, and bringing it back into the production cycle. They use traceability and uh, to, to ensure that all the waste being collected will be part again of the supply chain and will be reused again in the supply chain. As you see there in the, in the picture, they also use these non-motorized vehicles uh, to reduce their environmental footprint in these collections. And one other important piece is they formalize people's uh, uh, work in, through their program. So they hired ex-waste collectors, informal waste collectors to be part of their supply chain and be part of their um, their company. So with this program, we've been learning a lot. And of course, uh, we figure out and we started to map how our circular packaging programs could contribute towards other SDGs beyond the 12, right? So how we could create value into our communities uh, through the work we were doing through our circular packaging programs. Here is another example. Manja Pamozzi from Zambia, uh, that means hand, putting hands together or working together, uh, was born in 2014 uh, in different communities where we had waste issues and we were facing waste issues. The idea was to sensitize people and create awareness of how they could make their livelihoods out of uh, waste working in the waste uh, recycling uh, supply chain. So right now the program has more than 800 different collectors and it has more than 75%, uh, more than 75% of those collectors are women. And it is not by chance, right? So when we were setting up the program, the team went on these communities to understand their reality and to understand who are these people that would be part of these programs as well. And what they found was that women were the most vulnerable and the hunger ones looking for job opportunities uh, to, to work. So that's why when we were setting up the program, the program was made to, be, to include them uh, as well. And that is why uh, the numbers and the percentages are so high. Well, thinking uh, longer than this, what is happening is we figure out and we are learning really a lot throughout the process. What we understood was that the, this program works better when we have a collection point close to our collectors. So what we are doing is setting up uh, aggregators and selecting the high performance collectors with business acumen to be an aggregator in their region. Uh, we also uh, recognize that by doing that, uh, we have to support that. So we have to support them. So of course, we help them setting up this collection point. We also have help with PPEs and financing push cards. But of course, these aggregators are the ones that We'll continue the project locally and we'll hold uh, held the, um, the partnership with the collectors. Well, because Moja Pamozi was very well set up, uh, since the beginning, they were tracking who were these collectors working together with them, how many tons they were collecting, from the which materials they were collecting, uh, who were benefiting from their work, uh, what were their income versus a minimum wage? So because they were read so mature in the sense of tracking and understanding the impact they were uh, generating socially, we brought in 2019 BenQ to, to be part of this program. So BenQ uh, was already working with our farmers in Uganda as part of our smart agriculture program as well. And BQ is a supply chain management blockchain platform uh, that ultimately works to reduce poverty through traceability and transparency. The idea is 
the platform gives people working in the informal value chain the visibility to their work, reducing the risk, for example, to microfinance. For us, it's, always, it's also super relevant because it enables us to have access to these people and to have visibility of their contribution uh, as well in our programs. From this project and from this partnership with BenQ, we learned a lot. And coming into that, during the second cohort last year, we engaged with Normal Waste that was joining the, the accelerator. And we were able to start a new project in Colombia that is Return Home, where we are rescuing good bottles to, from the market to come back and to be part back again of our supply chain. I'll share the video where I can explain a little bit more in details what, how does it happen, and I'll share a, a little bit of the background later on. le vamos a seguir el rastro a esta botella desde que sale de la barra hasta que llega a la bodega y le vamos a mostrar el camino de vuelta a casa a la cervecería de Bavaria. So the minute you buy that bottle at a bar, the bottle's life begins and that bottle goes from the bar to a bin and it sits in a bin till these amazing recyclers come in the middle of the night, right? to save the planet, in my opinion. They'll pick up these bottles in really harsh conditions. They'll put it on a truck and bring it to a cooperative. Aquí nosotros venimos con mis compañeros, llegamos a las 7, 8 de la noche, acá a la zona, y empezamos a sacar las basuras de los bares, los almacenes, los restaurantes, y llegamos aquí a separar el material. When they bring it to a cooperative, it is sorted so that the recycler now gets a income out of that recycling. Acabamos de llegar a Logirec, una de las cooperativas donde llegan las botellas que vamos a retornar a casa. Principalmente tenemos un proyecto con el vidrio. Nosotros estamos recogiendo cerca de 300 toneladas más o menos al mes. They actually bring it together because they are the ones who are picking up the bottle, warehousing it, and then bringing it to Bavaria so it can be put back into the supply chain. And this entire value chain for me is the absolute perfect circular economy. We've discovered a huge number of women who are real entrepreneurs in the value chain and they need some additional support in terms of how they build their businesses. They're supporting multiple people within their families. They have children who they need to get educated. Um, there are young people working in the value chain that we can help to move into better employment situations. Normal Waste is an empresa de reciclaje y BankQ, una plataforma digital que nos permite tener trazabilidad de toda la cadena de valor. Juntos vamos a mejorar la calidad de vida de cientos de recicladores a la vez que aumentamos el reuso de las botellas de cerveza. La meta de Nomo para el 2020 es llegar a todas las partes de Colombia, a todos los rincones. Nomo, junto con Bavaria, busca transformar a Colombia. So, uh, what happens in Colombia is we are reinventing our returnable system to be sure that we are returning the biggest amount possible of bottles good bottles into our supply chain. And you saw there uh, during the video, Claire Flaner, that is our human rights uh, expert and is part of all these developments. Uh, she, she was there as well to be sure that we are taking care of human rights and that we are adding the social impact framework into the, the work uh, and the implementation the team was doing as well. So, just to give a little bit of a background, what happens in Colombia. Colombia, uh, in Colombia, there are 25,000 families living out of the recycling value chain and the recycling business. In this project in Bogota, we are working with a thousand uh, waste recyclers. And 
the full transparency and traceability to this process, guarantee visibility to the work they are doing, guarantee they are, that they are being properly paid, and that ultimately they will have access to finance uh, and to financial infrastructure. Uh, important to mention, through the program, because we are they are collecting great bottles back into the system, we are able to pay more for them, and so they are able to make a better income as well for themselves. So it's a win-win situation that we are very proud of and that is working since last year. And we are now planning to roll out to other countries as well. Uh, another relevant point I think Claire mentioned during the video is how it is difficult for women to be part of this recycling uh, supply chain and the team being mindful about that, uh, figure out how to uh, lend push electric push cards or bicycles for those collectors to improve their working conditions. Of course, it is not only for women, but we believe this type of action could help women to be uh, also to join better the type of program. So I brought few examples here of programs we are doing, but the truth is that we know we engage with thousands of informal collectors and recycle, recyclers through our circular packaging programs. From an internal mapping, we believe we are uh, working indirectly with 25,000 people and through the globe, of course. And we know these people, these waste recyclers, play a vital role to our communities, keeping our communities clean and helping them, to, helping us to get into our 2025 sustainability goal to have 100% of our packaging either returnable or made of majority recycled content. But there is one important fact. They are arguably some of the most vulnerable people within our supply chain. So thinking about that, in a partnership with Oxfam, we developed last year the social impact framework and implementation toolkit. The idea is to be mindful when we are setting up a new program, when we are designing, planning, or even being mindful on the programs that we have already in place to be able to include this and embed human rights and social impact into our programs. Uh, we also bring to our teams tools for them to better understand what are the social needs that community need, have, right? And that those waste collectors have. It help, the toolkit helps the team to define what is this design, to br bringing information on how to integrate recyclers into the formal economy, uh, how to define key performance indicators, as well as applying these gender lenses uh, on throughout the, the program, and as well helping them think on, thinking on how to address possible negative unintended, unintended consequences. So it is really about being taking a holistic approach in our circular packaging to be sure that we are contributing not only to the environmental piece, but also to the social and commercial ones. So as I shared here with you, we it's really about the circular packaging programs are about rethinking our packaging, engaging consumers, closing the loop, but also developing inclusive supply chains. You can see uh, more of our work here with the QR code, but important to mention that despite all the challenges, we have a clear view that the impact we want to mindfully create, and we will continue to embrace social impact and human rights into our circular packaging programs. We learned a lot since we set up our 2025 sustainability goals, especially last year during uh, 2020. And because of that, I'll close with a summary of these learnings and the main actions that we are taking towards our 2025 sustainability goals here. Thank you so much for the opportunity.
this year, we witnessed a collision between humanity and the natural world. Under threat, communities united, making life-altering decisions to save lives. We are working hard to meet the challenges, but also know that the effects of climate change are on the horizon. And while our sustainability commitments remain unwavering, the future we want depends on bold leadership and agility today. We are investing in long-term restoration of watersheds in nearly 20 countries and have developed a path for returning each one to measurable health while also improving our water efficiency by 35% in the last decade. We're working to bring regenerative practices and high-tech analytics to over 20,000 farmers, safeguarding both our future and theirs. We are co-innovating with thousands of suppliers and leading the transition to a low-carbon future and fully circular economies. We're delivering efficiencies and creating new value for our brands while innovating for the future of consumption. When we have the chance to push the world forward, our words matter. Which is why we've joined new forums and partnerships that will keep us on the cutting edge. Our business is deeply rooted in local communities. When they thrive, we thrive. So we empower them to make the world safer and more equitable. We always bring people together and we won't stop now. We don't know what tomorrow will bring, but we know who we are. We don't take shortcuts. We don't run from challenges. We dream big, and we are never completely satisfied with our results. Our future is bright, and the next 100 years start today. Visit the Web Packaging Live. Source packaging in an innovative way. Browse the exhibition halls. Filter suppliers by market and product. Visit the supplier's interactive 3D stands. Interact with their products. Contact with chat. Visit the Web Packaging Live. Contact live at webpackaging.com to get started. Wow, what a way to kick off the conference. Thanks, Aline. That was incredible. The way that AB InBev's sustainable packaging strategy incorporates environmental and societal goals is a great example for other global leaders to follow. I love the formalization and the bringing of dignity to the waste pickers and recognizing them as an essential part of the business, which is really powerful. And of course, AB InBev's mantra that their responsibility extends beyond the last sip of beer. It is now my great honor to welcome to the stage one of the titans of our community, Mr. Mike Baxter. 
Mike is the Director of External Affairs for Berry Global and has spent over 45 years in the polythene extrusion, converting and recycling sector. Mike represents Berry BPI at UK and European government levels plus trade associations including Plastics Recyclers Europe and the British Plastics Federation Recycling Group. Berry Global is a Fortune 500 company with 47,000 employees across more than 295 locations. Berry Global partners with customers to develop, design and manufacture innovative packaging products with an eye toward the circular economy. Mike's episode is entitled Recycling the Unrecyclable. With over 30 plus innovation centers around the world, Berry Global will highlight its pathways to tackling some of the greatest challenges in the packaging industry. Please put your hands together for Mike and please remember to ask questions in the chat. Hello everybody and thank you for joining. I'm Mike Baxter and I'm the Director of External Affairs for Berry, and it's a real pleasure to be here and talk to you all today. I'm based here in the United Kingdom and uh, I've been in the plastics industry for uh, 40 years actually and uh, I've loved every minute of it. It's a great industry to be in. But I have to tell you that I've never seen such pressure on our industry. I've never seen our industry under so much scrutiny, especially in the area of polythene film recycling. So today I want to explore some of the areas and the myths that exist within the world of plastic film recycling and thus my presentation, Recycling the Unrecyclable. Is recycling used polythene flexible films a realistic proposition? I mean, I, you've often, some of you have heard me speak before and I'm always saying all plastic packaging is recyclable, which is true. But alternatively, some of the detractors from our industry, they say, that's just hype. That's just the plastics industry trying to defend itself when the reality is different. Right. What I want to explore today is the question does plastic packaging, especially flexible films, have a place in a more environmentally conscious world? I mean, there are many, many issues that face all stakeholders in the plastics value chain. I mean, it doesn't make any difference if you're a plastic packaging manufacturer, such as Berry, or a global brand, or a major retailer, or a collector, or a recycler, again, the same as Berry. I mean, we're all in this together. And that's a key issue that is going to be a theme throughout my presentation. One of the questions is, we've got to be realistic about this. Will we still be using flexible polythene packaging films in 10 years time? You've noticed that I'm already referring to polythene flexible films. And in fact, I'm, I'm going to focus just on flexible films uh, for this presentation. As I've already said, Berry, we, we recycle rigid plastics as well. We recycle HDs, polyprops, a whole range. But I'm going to focus on flexible because that's the area that is under the biggest scrutiny at the moment. And I'm also going to look at what about all of the claims and the statements from certain organisations which tell us that plastic packaging is bad for the planet. And you know, you'll have seen the television programmes. You probably have read some of the articles which aren't exactly friendly. But again, to summing a recurring theme in the last years, the plastics industry and the users of plastic packaging have defended themselves. You know, we say quite rightly that plastic packaging it's lightweight, it's durable, it helps keep food fresher, longer. There's the issue of global warming and carbon footprint. We know 
that certain alternative non-plastic materials, which can be used for packaging, have a much higher carbon footprint, which could contribute to global warming. So surely we've got science on our side, haven't we? So we're all right to carry on using plastic packaging. Hmm. Unfortunately, that's not the case. There was a major survey recently by uh, a, a large uh, consumer organization in Europe. And they asked, not one or two, they asked 3,000 consumers, what were their biggest environmental concerns? What were the issues? And, and they gave all the respondents to this survey a list of options to score from the one that gave them the most concern to the one that gave the consumer the least concern. And on the list, there were things like global warming, rising sea temperatures, food wastage, air quality. But do you know what 67% of the respondents to that survey put as their number one concern for environmental issues? Yep, you guessed right. It was plastic packaging. So I think we've got to readdress things now. We've got to start being more proactive. We've got to stop relying on the old stuff that we've used for years. And we've used the arguments, haven't we, over and again. But all we've got to do is collect more polythene, recycle it. And that's the answer. And I'm sure lots of you have go to lots of presentations like this and we've all seen these lovely little diagrams haven't we you know they're always the same ones they're circular there's always a happy family in it and some polythene being collected and a lorry going to a mysterious plastics recycling factory we wonder what goes inside and, and before those of you that have noticed yes this is actually is one of our one of our um little diagram so just goes to show that I'm showing that we're doing it as well but here's the question I mean how many of you have actually seen a commercial operation recycling used post-consumer polythene films yeah I'm talking about now the thousands of tons of polythene film that consumers, householders, put in their trash bags, put in their trash cans, put in their rubbish bags, put out for the recycler to come round. Have you seen that being done? Not just a couple of kilos for a promotional video. I was on a, I was on a call a couple of weeks ago and there was a very well-meaning UK supermarket who, who told us that they'd been collecting packaging from the front of their store. And uh, after a week, they got two kilos of clear polythene, which they've recycled. In the UK, we put more than 500,000 tonnes a year of flexible polythene packaging on the market that ends up in the domestic waste stream.
you've just seen a video that shows how it can be done. And I purposely let you have a look at it first because I was posing the question, have you seen it being done? Well, there you are. You've just seen it being done. That was a video from our Berry BPI Recycled Products Factory in Hena, Derbyshire. It was a joint venture with our good friends and customers, Nestle, where we took commercial quantities of used plastic packaging, which had been collected from curbside, what's called curbside in the UK, homes in Cambridgeshire, and it had a pre-sort, you could probably tell looking at the material, the material had a pre-sort and then it was washed and the video says it all. So the original question was, have you ever seen it done? Well, you have now. And if you'd like to see a longer version of that, then uh, there is a, a much longer version showing in detail more of the uh, recycling processes and the manufacturing processes, then please join us in our booth afterwards for the Q&A. And uh, if you give us your name and details, uh, we can talk about sending you a longer version. So there you are, you've seen it. We've got nothing to hide. But a lot of organizations say, oh, well, you might be able to recycle it and turn it into new film, which we've done there, but it's not collected. And even when it is, there's no market for the recycled material that's produced. Look at the state of it. What are people's answers to that? Once again, stop using flexible plastic packaging. That's what they say. And going back to my earlier comments about the big survey, that showed that 67% of respondents to the survey thought that plastic packaging was the biggest environmental concern. This is what we've got to address. But actually, once again, the reality is different. But sadly, in the UK, only 6% of all used flexible packaging is recovered for recycling in the UK. I know it's an appalling figure, isn't it? Yep, only 6%. Where does the rest of it go? Well, we're told some of it gets recycled. Yeah, it goes on a boat. I don't think I need to say any more, do I? I think far too many of us have seen the shock horror documentaries and the various other TV programs showing plastic all around the world that's probably started off well-meaning to be recycled in the UK or the United States of America or anywhere else in Europe, but it doesn't happen. So where does this recycling take place? Well, we've got some in the UK and it's growing, but Look at the top figure, only 6%. So first of all, we've got to dramatically increase recovery and recycling rates. Now we've got extended producer responsibility initiatives all over Europe now. Um, on top of that, we've got the Wrap Plastic Pact in the United Kingdom, uh, the Circular Plastics Alliance, in Brussels from the European Union. We've got CPLEX, CFLEX, the Circular Flexibles Recycling Initiative. But EPR initiatives take time to set up. And is this quick enough? I'd suggest it isn't. I'd suggest that all stakeholders, coming back to this theme, that all stakeholders now I've got to look at this and look at how we can quickly start increasing recovery rates of used plastic packaging and recycling it. That's the way that we, all of us, all stakeholders can demonstrate to the people that, and the organizations that want to do our industry down, it can be done. And by the way, 
you can't leave it just to recyclers. It's no good sort of thinking, oh, well, yeah, I'll put a bin out the front there and I'll collect a bit of polythene and give it to a recycler. It doesn't work like that anymore. Going back to the Nestle video that you've just seen, that worked because all of the stakeholders were working towards the same, the same shared goal. And it worked perfectly. I mean, it's great to think, you know, going back to that, you know, there's jars of coffee, mate, out there at the moment in the big wide world that are wrapped in polythene shrink film that's 100% recycled content, a lot of which has come out of people's doorsteps. I think that's a great story, and we've got to do more of it. But how are we going to do it? Well, a good example, and it's happening a lot now in the UK, is front of store collection schemes. Now these can be set up quickly. And what happens is that uh, customers are encouraged to take their used plastic packaging back to stores. And by the way, it doesn't have to be, um, you know, if you've got retailer A, they're not saying, well, I only want packaging that came from my store, not from retailer B. No, consumers are encouraged just to take their used plastic packaging back. The material then needs a sort, but it, I would suggest it must be recycled in the country of collection. I'd maybe give a, a, a bit of a, a leeway on that, that if it's within the European Union, um, that you could have material cross-border within the European Union. But I certainly, we are opposed to the principle that material comes to a front of store collection and then goes to the Pacific Rim for recycling. That's not sustainable. And it leaves our industry open to all sorts of comments. So retailers and brands, you've got a part to play in this because you've got to make sure that this recovered material actually has a second life. It's not just a case of collecting it and recycling it. There's a lot more to it than this. But in the UK, on a very positive note, virtually all now of the major retailers are have either rolled out or in the process of rolling out front of store collection schemes. And this is excellent news. And bring schemes are not solely the focus of grocery retailers. For example, last year, unfortunately, COVID-19 intervened, uh, but last year uh, we were involved with a project um, with a major producer of uh, garden peat, you know, the sort of multi-purpose compost that we all use in our gardens, our hanging baskets and our window boxes. And this initiative encouraged consumers to bring their used polythene sacks that originally had garden peat, bark chippings, whatever in, back to a garden centre and the sacks and bags are then baled, collected and washed in a, has to be a wash plant, a recycling plant, and then can be turned into new heavy duty sacks. So it isn't just grocery retailing. We've all just got to start thinking a little bit laterally now about how we're doing it. But by doing it this way, by encouraging the consumer to bring their packaging back. And this is another really important facet of this. It demonstrates to the consumer that all of us in the value chain do care about what happens to use flexible packaging. And that we're not prepared just to sit back and let it go on the way it has in the past, put it in a container, send it to the Pacific Rim, shut your eyes and forget about it. So what do we do? We collect, we separate and we recycle. But I can't address you today without telling you that it's not easy compared to recycling, ordinary what over here, we call commercial and industrial. This is things like back of store, heavy duty shrink wrap. When you are collecting consumer front of store, believe me, because <laughs> we're doing it. I, 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 I couldn't tell you because there's probably children listening. Um, but uh, some of the stuff that we get back is quite unbelievable. You encourage consumers just to bring their flexible packaging and they'll bring anything back and they, they think they're doing the right thing. 
So we've got to be prepared for that. And um, our, our, um, our big recycling plant in Hena in Derbyshire, it's actually built with this in mind. If you know you're going to be recycling this, then you have to build for it. But the pellet it produces isn't, we'll say, 100% similar to virgin. And this is where stakeholder collaboration comes in. Over time coming forward, the big brands I know, especially those signed up to C-Flex and Wrap, Plastic Pact and the CPA, are reducing the amount of different types of plastic material that's going into packaging. That's a good thing. That helps. But we've still got a commingled waste stream. And whilst we can refine it to an extent, we then do need markets for the pellet afterwards. And this is this really is closed loop. And um, I, I can't tell you who this major retailer is, obviously, but we are um, now recycling front of store material you can see in the middle, turning it into pellets and remanufacturing it into black refuse sacks or trash bags as they're known. And this is an ideal outlet for these materials. So that's how you really close the loop. That's closed loop recycling. And it, it's not restricted just to flexible films, by the way. You can do the same thing where we've got a large new, uh, it's being built at the moment, actually, um, a Rigid's recycling factory, uh, again, over here in the UK, which is going to um, recycle polyprop, polypropylene and high density rigid materials to food grade standards. So all this can be done, but we need markets. And this is where the cooperation, this is where everyone in the value chain, if you're prepared to work together, we can do it. And it is so important because then it means that we can say to the detractors of our industry, uh, we are doing something, we are moving forward. I want to see the recycling of used post-consumer packaging as the new normal. I don't want to see it as something unusual or even something that you make videos about. Going forward, if we're to have a strong, flexible packaging and all plastic packaging industry, we've got to embrace these new technologies. We've got to embrace this new way of thinking and we're doing it at Berry. We're doing it through innovative recycling. We're doing it through reuse initiatives. And with our partners, with all players, it's achievable. And it's an alternative to landfill or energy from waste or deep sea export. We've got to do it. And I would urge all of you today that if you are a purchaser, a specifier, a user, of flexible packaging and all plastic packaging, now's the time. Now's the time to go to your supplier. It doesn't necessarily need to be Berry, although I hope it is. But even if it's not, go to your suppliers and say, I want to ensure that my materials are recycled, genuinely recycled, not put in a container, not sent to a third world country, not put in an incinerator, not put in a hole in the ground genuinely recycled and turned into new product, then we can all be proud of our industry. Thank you for listening. Sorry I went on a bit, but at Berry, we're here to help you achieve your sustainability goals. That's what we do. So if you'd like to discuss this more, then please join us in our virtual booth afterwards. Uh, you've had details already of how to do this. Uh, if you'd like another copy, or a longer copy of the uh, Nestle video, then join us. And I think I'm writing saying that uh, we will have some very, very senior executives from Berry Global Worldwide in the booth. So you can talk to the people that right at the top that make the decisions. So once again, thank you for listening and enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>
True 3D product. Animations and Interactions Videos and Audio Our best-selling products this year are a collection of PET bottles for hand sanitizer. Human avatars. Virtual reality enabled. Integrated chat. Generate sales leads and get insights into who is clicking on what. Visit www.expomaker.com now. Thanks so much, Mike. I loved your honesty and clarity. You clearly have as much passion about plastics and recycling today as you did when you first entered the sector which can only be a good thing for our industry going forward. I completely agree with you that all stakeholders must collaborate to increase the speed of recovery and recycling. And I am sure that Berry Global will play a key role in this exciting vision. It is now time for me to welcome our third and final keynote speaker to the Packaging for the Planet 2021 conference. Please put your hands together and welcome Colgate Palmolive's Packaging, Sustainability and Innovation Manager, Adrian Sen. Adrian leads Colgate's development, deployment and advocacy of European packaging sustainability programmes. He works across packaging, marketing and the supply chain to address the most challenging and packaging sustainability issues. Colgate was founded 215 years ago as one of the world's biggest FMCG companies with a turnover in 2019 of $15.6 billion and employs 34,500 people. Adrian's episode is entitled Building a Packaging Future to Smile About, how Colgate Palmolive is reducing its environmental footprint one tube at a time. Take it away, Adrian. And as always, please feel free to pop your questions in the chat function. Hello, everyone. I'm very happy today to have the opportunity to present you Colgate's one of the biggest achievements in packaging sustainability, but also show you or give you a glimpse of our strategy, as well as to have the opportunity to exchange with you how we are able to uh, cooperate together to basically make our future better and reduce waste or specifically plastic waste. My name is Adrian Sen. I'm the European Packaging Sustainability and Innovation Manager at Colgate. And one of my main responsibility is to partner with internal, uh, internal teams, basically marketing, sales, and of course the packaging department to find growth opportunities related to packaging sustainability, support or execute them in the end to basically make our future more sustainable and uh, reduce packaging and also yeah, uh, make, make packaging in a better uh, view. Now, I will give you uh, three parts. What I want to show you is basically the uh, Colgate's 2025 sustainability and social impact strategy. So that you have a holistic view where we are going and where we want to achieve then go specifically on the packaging strategy and goals. And last but not least, one example, how we executed our ambitions and our goals in terms of the recyclable tube. 
Now, when it comes to Colgate um, as a global leader, we know and we believe that we have a responsibility to address the need to improve the environment. Uh, in general, based on the data, let's say around about 80% of the people feel strongly that companies as us have a responsibility to improve the environment. And the good thing is that uh, about 60% of households worldwide have a Colgate product at home. So we have a big brand penetration. And this means uh, that we have a unique position and a great power to drive change, but also a great responsibility to work together with people to create a better future. Now, when it comes to the, uh, our key ambitions, we have um, segmented or taken our sustainability and social impact strategy in three pillars. One is to drive the social impact. The other is helping millions of homes. And the third is preserving environment. Uh, today, I will focus more on the preserving the environment because I think this is mainly related to packaging. Uh, but nevertheless, there are aspects also when it comes to packaging, which are touching the others. And at Colgate Palmolive, uh, we are very proud, really proud that we have that big market penetration. So we are reaching many homes and that we are due to that able uh, to, to basically create, uh, we will also create a healthier and more sustainable future at all. And of course, packaging in our products are having here a significant role. Now, the uh, 11 sustainability action, as I mentioned, we have these three pillars, driving social impact on one side, helping million of homes and preserving our environment. Helping million of homes, when it comes to packaging in our products, that's where I want to focus today. Uh, one aspect is to design sustainable products. Basically that our consumers, when they are using them, they have a positive impact in the environment. And the other one is also preserving the environment. Uh, that's of course one of the main um, target or the main aspect for packaging is to eliminate plastic waste and also to drive sustainable sourcing. I mean, as, as Colgate, we have a global value chain and we, we have the opportunity and the responsibility to um, influence it in a, positive, in a positive way. Design sustainable products. So this is just giving an, an example of three products um, which are recently launched or have been launched in the, in the recent times uh, and are respecting, let's say, our sustainability goals. So we have one uh, Colgate Smile for Good. It's a toothpaste, which I will explain also later, which is recyclable. Um, and beside, let's say the packaging, uh, it also has ingredients uh, of natural origins. Then we have the Sanex Zero Percentage, which is a 99% biodegradable formula uh, and contains zero sulfates, colorants, and zero soap. So a very, I would say, natural driven formulation. Then you have the supplying. So it's a plant-based fabric conditioner and is using a recyclable bottle and 100% recycled content. Drive sustainable sourcing is very important. As I mentioned, uh, we are a global company with a global value chain, and we need to engage with our, sustain with our suppliers uh, to basically um, source responsible, but also uh, adapt their production facilities and, and uh, their value chain as well uh, into a positive um, environmental footprint, for example. And we have a clear commitment to achieve net zero deforestation, prioritizing palm and soy. And we also want to engage with all our suppliers to basically um, ensure this uh, or to reduce this water um, usage. So basically um, ensuring that we are um, using less water because water is a very important resource. And the other aspect is also uh, engaging with supplier to reduce their absolute greenhouse gas emissions. These are, I would say, our overall aspects. 
When it comes to packaging specifically, of course, we are looking into um, new opportunities, new ideas, which can drive to eliminate plastic, to increase the PCR content, but also to reduce the carbon footprint. So here it's, it's a big area where we're open and we are engaging with different suppliers to find basically new ideas, new innovation, new areas, um, which can help us to preserve the environment. Of course, beside, let's say, this sustainability aspect, we also need to uh, keep in mind there are some regulation or safety aspects, which are also requirements we need to um, respect and we need to address to our suppliers. So beside the sourcing and the supply chain, this is one of our, let's say, main target and also where we have responsibility is to eliminate plastic waste. Uh, so here, um, one big aspect or one, let's say, target what we're having is to make all our packaging recyclable, reusable or compostable by 2025. In the end, with the overall target uh, to basically make the packaging circular. Uh, and the other aspect is, as I mentioned, we want to eliminate uh, our virgin plastic. And I will describe it a bit later. Uh, and here we are cooperating with the Alan MacArthur Foundation, but we are also engaged, for example, with the consumer goods firm to align with other brand owners um, on those targets, how to measure them so that we have a common approach within the industry, but also within, I would say, all um, brand owners, or all um, players in the fast moving consumer goods area. Uh, and to promote also the circular uh, packaging, we have committed to use a minimum 25 uh, post-consumer recycled plastic by 2025. Um, and uh, it's important for us basically to respect all the design guidelines out which are promoting this uh, circular economy. Now here specifically on the gold, so that you have it uh, in, a, in a bigger picture on a, on a clear view, is one aspect is really to say no to unnecessary and problematic packaging. Here we are following basically all the discussions or all the uh, topics from a legal perspective. So for example, for Europe, the European New Green Deal, but also exchanges and alignments within the industry, for example, from the consumer goods forum. Um, the second that I mentioned already, we committed to reduce or eliminate one third of our virgin plastic consumption. So we are taking here a base of, of, a, of, a, of a 2019 and said, despite the growth, what we are having, we need to reduce it to one third virgin plastic. And by that, by default, I would say it increases the recycled content, but nevertheless, we have committed to the 25 post-consumer recycled um, plastic usage. And I mentioned it, all packaging needs to be recyclable, reusable and compostable. Now, these are our KPIs or the metrics, how we are measuring that we are progressing uh, towards a, a better future, uh, towards uh, to preserve our environment. How we come to this, uh, we have a strategy and uh, we have set up four different pillars. So one is the source responsibility, basically to ensure that our value chain is also respecting our commitments and our goals. The other, this is more to us, is we need to deliver efficient and beneficial design. And I will come to it later to describe it to you. The third is basically, uh, this is the, the thing what uh, we are looking into is to make the packaging circular. And in the end of the day, I mean, we can do a lot, but also our con consumers need to uh, behave in that way. So we also want to inspire them in a positive behavior. What does it mean? So source responsible, responsible uh, is basically, yes, as I said, we, we are increasing our recycled content. We want to use also certified sourced materials. So here it comes, for example, specifically to FSC certified one, but also there can be other one uh, in terms of bio-based material, et cetera. So it's open. Uh, and then the other is also what we are exploring is to uh, basically look into renewable materials and boost them if possible, if it's a good solution. When it comes to the deliver efficient and beneficial design, of 
course, one aspect is what we need to respect is the to eliminate all of the unnecessary and problematic packaging. But then also when we go into the waste hierarchy, uh, it's also important to basically reduce what is not needed. So meaning use less plastic if possible uh, and really look into it if we have opportunities to reduce the weight or to design the packaging in that way that we don't have to use all the inlays, all the specific parts, which maybe we have used in the past. So just be very functional in that way. Uh, and the third one of that area is to uh, create new forms. I mean, uh, there are maybe some new forms which uh, have a beneficial designs. And I'm looking here also to this circular system. So meaning uh, reuse and refill system. So this is a new form which uh, we are promoting basically in, in mind that uh, it, in the end, it leads to less plastic waste or packaging waste if you are reusing and refilling your primary packaging. Uh, design for recyclability and compostability, I, I mentioned it, that's it's, it's the uh, first thing to promote uh, circular packaging, but everything goes or very important in that area is to have the infrastructure. So that's uh, the reason why we are here partnering uh, and collaborating in consortium of plastic packs and others to basically to ensure or to find opportunities how we are able to increase the collection of our packaging and the overall recycling. The last one is the um, to inspire the positive behavior. So we need to also make sure that our consumers understand how the packaging is used and recycled right. So that's something where we need to be, uh, be very transparent, meaning in our packaging, in our websites, in our communication, that they are clear what it is about and how this gets then uh, disposed. And in the end also, that's uh, important for us to lead with brand purpose. What I will show you right now is basically one of the achievement what we have put in the market is our recyclable tube. And for us, and I think it's still, it's a, a disruptive innovation. And we are trying to basically um, bring this into the market and transition it that, to the whole industry. So when we're looking into recycling, we needed to understand the full value chain. So we have a packaging at the beginning and this packaging, if it's used by the consumer, uh, at, at a certain stage, it gets into the bin. Now here, we need to be clear where it gets collected. Then when it gets collected, it gets sorted in these facilities. Uh, and when it gets sorted by, for example, different material fractions, it gets reprocessed. And in the end, what we are aiming for is a real circular economy, meaning, for example, the bottles get into bottle application or the tubes get also into bottle application, flexibles, etc. So it gets back into, the, into a circular stage. Now, uh, what for us is important then to make it recyclable, we need to understand what are the requirements. And that's basically where from a design perspective, we had to start at the end, so at the reprocessing part. And here it was important basically really uh, to engage with, uh, for example, APR, and Recyclas in Europe, what are the requirements and needs from the recycling industry? So in terms of uh, how does the material needs to behave when it gets reprocessed? And this is basically where we have, uh, where we can uh, respect technical evaluation protocols and design guidelines. Sorting is another area. Uh, there are certain size requirements, material requirements, which we need to respect, uh, we need to have a certain evidence uh, from our packaging that it can get sorted or will be sorted in the right fraction and then gets reprocessed. And the other aspect then is to have the collection. So in here, either there is a collection available or we can educate and can ensure the consumer uh, where he needs to throw this, that it gets properly collect. And then based on that, uh, we have a clear understanding what we need to respect and how we need to redesign our, our packaging, or in this case, our tube. So here the example, uh, the current tube uh, was um, a PP cap. We had a shoulder with a high melt flow 
in some aspect, we also have a certain insert as a flavor barrier. And the laminate uh, was uh, either containing an aluminum barrier or in some cases also a plastic barrier. That was the current state. And based on the requirements, uh, we had to change something. So we know that we wanted to go within this tube to the HTPE bottle stream. That means for the cap, for example, we didn't need to change anything because in most cases, also the current HTP bottles are having PP caps. So it was not a in, in neat change. However, we are also looking into uh, HTP caps so that it's a mono material. On the shoulder, uh, yes, we had to change something. The current uh, shoulder resin is using a high melt flow resin and that it can be um, uh, processed into a bottle we had to change it to a low melt flow index. Then the laminate, I mean, as I mentioned, it was either aluminum or a plastic barrier. So that is not uh, accepted in, in the HTP bottle stream. So we had to understand what kind of barrier or what kind, yeah, what kind of barrier would be acceptable on which threshold. And that means, or that resulted into that, we had to use a specific um, HDPE plastic laminate which also includes a, a barrier, but with a certain threshold, what is accepted. And there was challenges uh, when we had to transfer to that. One big challenge was, I mean, uh, the barrier. That's one thing what I mentioned. The other one is also that the tubes uh, within aluminum or within the, the current plastic barrier, they are nice to squeeze. And it, we had to change it, that it goes into the HDV bottle stream there was basically this challenge that it can't get squeezed. I mean, if you are trying to squeeze your HDP bottle, you see that, that there are certain limits. Uh, and then, of course, I mean, to change the whole value chain uh, and our production facilities, that this, let's say, new technologies can be also produced was also a challenge. Uh, now, we have partnered here very close with APR and Reciclas, which are basically um, a recycling organization and, and helping us to um, create and form design guidelines so that we as brand owners know exactly how we need to design them. And we get uh, here also for our tube some technical recognitions that this tube is recyclable. When it comes to further, let's say, acceptance, what I meant before, so the whole collection sorting, then it gets a bit more problematic. And here we need to have also a bigger scale um, of these tubes that they, are, that they are recyclable. And that's the reason why we are collaborating also with others. Uh, so for example, the plastic packs or more recycling, uh, which is a consortium with other different brand owners to basically to ensure that the acceptance of the tubes or the transition of such tube technology is taking part in the whole industry. As I mentioned, for North America, APR uh, is, is, a, is a big, um, let's say, um, driver for the whole recycling. Uh, and here we are creating with them, or we have created with them a tube design guideline so that other brand owners or the other industry can follow it. In Europe, uh, we have engaged also beside the uh, Reciclas or PRE with local organizations like CT or Recoup to understand uh, on, the, on the specific local um, collection schemes or um, let's say some certain requirements or limitations so that we can work further uh, to ensure this kind of recyclability and in other regions as well. So this is uh, basically something what we have put in the market uh, and we know it's not yet done. We need to pro progress on the acceptance level and uh, we are also happy to see that in the overall industry, there is a transition into this recyclable tube. That's all from my side and thank you uh, for your attention. Thank you, Adrian. That was absolutely fascinating. With 60% of households having Colgate palm olive products in their homes, you certainly have a huge environmental packaging responsibility on your shoulders. I really like the very simple objective of not having any unnecessary or problematic packaging. And I think your purpose of inspiring and helping good consumer behavior is really, really very clever. Ladies and gentlemen, 
That wraps up today's conference. And so thank you to our speakers and thank you to you for watching and engaging. And now back to Duncan for some closing thoughts. What an incredible insight this has been as to how both brands and packaging suppliers are taking major steps to reduce their impact on the environment. Thanks again to the speakers for giving us their time today and to help make this a better planet and to the sponsors for making this possible. Do not forget to tune in on the 10th of June for another three amazing speakers, including Tetra Pak and Danone. We now invite you to enter the Web Packaging Live show by typing webpackaging.live into a web browser on your PC. From there, you can access the Packaging for the Planet lobby and we will, in the future, be able to review the recordings from key speakers. Please share webpackaging.live with your colleagues so that they too can view the content in the future. Meanwhile, check out the sponsor interactive 3D booths, those with the 3D symbol by the name. If you are a supplier and would like more information about exhibiting at Web Packaging Live, please email live at webpackaging.com. If you are a brand or interested in creating a pack innovation portal, including searches for eco-friendly packaging, please email hello at webpack.com. And also do not hesitate to email me directly via hello at webpack.com as well, and we can continue the conversation. Thank you for attending Packaging for the Planet 2021 and look forward to seeing you on the 10th of June.